Hello, old friends. Welcome to episode three of the Rena Hundred Show. Rena Hundred, that's me, whatever that means. Um, and the theme for this show is magical thinking. Magical thinking, but <laughs> So yeah, today is all about magic. What do we think about magic? How does magic help us in our lives? Should we have grown out of magic? Magic. But before I get to all that, this. If you really like our show, and by us, I mean me, uh, you can contribute to our Patreon. The link to the Patreon is in our Instagram bio. Uh, our Instagram is at the Rena Hundred Show. Um, Follow us on Instagram. Contribute if you can, um, or if you love this show that much. We'd love it, but we love you either way. And by we, I mean me. I, me, I, I, me. <laughs> All right, so magic. What is magic? It feels very Disney the way I'm hearing myself half sing say it. Right now, I guess Disney's kind of co-opted a lot of the modern basic elementary views on maybe like childhood framing of magic. I feel like a lot of our first exposures to the idea of magic is in cartoon and it was either Disney or those other companies. Um, but to me, magic is a ch at a certain point, it's a choice of as an adult, that was my alarm going off for my laundry. <laughs> uh, as an adult, magic is a choice uh, that we make in our mind to ascribe to something that's happened coincidentally. Like, it's funny, like, once I had decided to make this podcast about magic, I was on a Zoom meeting and somebody was telling a story about cutting their finger, totally innocuous. And then just now, when I was putting away the... Um, tin foil into my drawer I accidentally cut my finger on it and I was like weird because I just heard the cutting my finger story from someone else now if I'm in a more if, if I'm deciding to ascribe magic to that coincidence or if I'm feeling like the world is particularly magical that day that could put me in a frame of mind of like wow today I'm really making things happen from being exposed to things or I guess living in LA a lot of people think of their lives in a magical way where like the word manifest gets thrown around a lot where people feel like um, if I focus on something with the absence of fear uh, I can just kind of make it happen um, and a lot of that comes from privilege people who just have the privilege of having been able to make a lot of things happen in their lives that they wanted to happen. But some of it also, I don't know sometimes because there are days and times in my life and maybe it's just the particular chemical makeup of the way my brain and body and heart are functioning on that day. But there are definitely days where things do seem to just magically materialize um, in such a way, positively or negatively, depending how I'm feeling. Um, if I'm feeling bad, things usually get worse. If I'm feeling good, things usually get better. Um, so there is some kind of strange interplay between in our inner emotional world. And maybe it's just that it affects the way we react to things and things aren't actually getting better or worse depending on how we feel. Um, but maybe they are. I mean... Because the deeper your interaction becomes with the world around you, like let's say the natural world, even the not, even the man-made world, um, the more magical and illuminated everything kind of becomes once you start really deeply paying attention to it. And of course, it takes a certain amount of restful clarity to get into a place where you can see the world as magical and the fact that all of us are alive as being a miracle, you know, like that takes a certain time off from the drudgery of your day to day. 
Um, and maybe that's part of why people potentially feel more magical on vacation. But once you get into a mind frame, well, let me give you an example. Um, so there was a summer when I was in college where, uh, for credit, we went on a trip to Newfoundland and, um, I happened to have a little bit of money in the bank and me and a friend of mine, uh, decided not to go back with the with the car that was supposed to drive us back home to Montreal. And we decided to just hitchhike our way around the East Coast and rely on the kindness of strangers and just be, you know, happy, free 22-year-olds in the world. You know, peak, peak energy, peak emotions. There was a lot going on that summer. But because I was in such a special... Uh, kind of restful yet energetic uh, and emotionally positive place. I found myself interacting with the natural world in a very new way where I found that by the end of the summer, if I took time (laughs) and I wasn't doing any um, hallucinogenics or hard drugs, Um, But I found that if I took time with a plant, I could like pick one plant, look into the plant, let's say a flower, look into the flower. And I'd go through a long, like several roads in my mind of um, wanting to connect to the flower, wanting to let the flower in, wanting to really internalize the fact that the flower was alive. And I'd go through several steps. And the final last step before I could really connect with the the life of that plant was doubt. Was doubt that the connection was even possible. And then as soon as that doubt was removed, I swear to you, and this could have been my imagination. And of course, magic and imagination, very linked. But as soon as the doubt was removed, I swear I could feel the life force of that plant. And I could feel it perceiving me the way I was perceiving it. And there was some kind of connective force between my perception and its life force. Um, Yeah, so... So is that magical thinking? Is it real? Is it not real? Is anything real? We can't prove that anything's... I mean, in theory, everything's just some kind of imaginary, magical land around us. And inside, too. We can't prove any of it. So everything really is magical. But if we're not thinking about it in a magical way, then it doesn't come across as magical. So on the subject of magic, I did have the opportunity to go see some magicians perform (laughs) this year with a friend of mine at this place called the Magic Castle in LA. Um, And it got me thinking about magicians, not as the people themselves, but the magic that they do that is... It's illusion, but it is an illusion that is fun, and people want to believe the illusion, and so they decide to believe the illusion, and so they have a fun night watching things they know are fake, but they can't figure out how they did it, and they want to believe it's magic. I suppose it's a way of connecting with your initial childlike wonder that you experienced the first time you discovered things in the world. And that is where a lot of the magic lies. If you want to bring magic into your life, it's connecting to the way you felt when you first discovered the world as a child. And in those moments, because being a child is kind of like being an interdimensional being that's just recently... a Um, arrived into this dimension and so you don't really understand like the physical rules and limitations of it and so anything is in fact possible as a child and then as you go get older you slowly rule out possibilities of what things can actually do like 
you know, the back of a wardrobe is probably not going to bring you to a whole secret world with an evil ice queen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that initial wonder where anything is possible to me is, is a lot of where magic lies in our minds. And jumping off point from there, it's also that frame of mind that allows us to see more possibilities than maybe we've been allowing ourselves to see to new roads in our lives. And connecting to that initial magical thinking could be a really positive thing because maybe in your process of growing up, you've closed you've closed off more possibilities than you needed to, perhaps in an effort to stay sane and safe. But maybe opening up that door just a little creak could show you ways you could improve your life that you thought uh, weren't available to you when in fact they are. Thinking of your life as magical takes a certain amount of detachment from it and from the outcome to where you're thinking of your life as a fun thing that's sort of malleable that you can play with like Plato. Like I can play with my life in this fun way where it's magical. <laughs> I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. So it's like when you're like, my life is magical and I'm going to play with that and I'm going to see what comes with it. To me, that's almost like thinking of your life more like a game, um, which always scares me a little bit because I, I've, I've assumed that that's how sociopaths think about their life. Like, like so you don't want to be detached to the point where you're disassociated and you put everything that's happening on a lower rung than your own selfish wants. Um, but I think a certain level of detachment can be... I mean, I wonder, is it a coping mechanism to detach and have fun with it? Is it because I can't actually handle being intimately emotionally involved in all the circumstances in my life? Or is it a healthy kind of Buddhist thing of just like, I am the witness and I'm witnessing my life, but I'm not necessarily at the very edge of the interaction of it, the, the sharp inflective point. Um, so I wonder about this. This is something I wonder about often, most a lot of the time, um, which made me think of this thing my brother told me once, and I think he was taking a class or reading a book on meditative exercises um and one of them was to imagine that all of your life you've been fighting with this dragon you know i mean i picture it like a prince sword fighting a dragon or a princess you know you have your sword you're fighting the dragon and sometimes nobody's won yet sometimes the dragon is winning Sometimes you're winning, but you've always been fighting this dragon. And then just to imagine at one point that the dragon is turned away from you, and then he slowly turns his head back towards you. Mid-fight, he turns his head back to you and just winks. <laughs> um, and to me, that means... It's the universe, Ugh, I hate saying the universe, but you know what I mean. It's the everything reminding you that it's just a, well, as Bill Hicks would say, it's just a ride. Um, or it's just a game, or this is, like, don't take it too seriously. But then I wonder, in my quest to take things less seriously... Am I avoiding the full depth and breadth of the life experience that's available to me? In other words, is magical thinking something that helps me grow or stops me from experiencing the pain I need in order to grow? And probably the maddening answer that our brains can't fully process is it's both. 
<laughs> All right. So I'm going to end this episode with a little recording just for fun, just to lighten the mood after all that contemplative babbling um, of a song that I improvised in Portland about, um, well, you'll see. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for tuning in. It's been nice to talk and I hope you're having a great Sunday. So uh, does anybody have a, like a longing for a song to be about something? Giraffe. Giraffe? Yeah. Okay. What's your personal connection to giraffes? The, the ambleingness of it all. You know, the, all, the, all the angles. The really angles. The angles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The angles on the giraffe. The ambleingness. Can you expand a little bit? Um, sometimes when I move, I feel very awkward the way that a giraffe would move. You know, the whole thing just seems like a chair that came to life and none of it seems to be <laughs> <laughs>